the growth in malware is us, the user, through social engineering, and uh, and we must understand that majority of us are Microsoft Windows user. Anyone, uh, any Apple fan over there? Uh, I'm sure there's few of you are Apple fan, at least an iPhone, right? Okay, so just to recap uh, some of the things we discussed yesterday, uh, Microsoft Office is a primary attack point. Uh, most of the tools breed malwares. About 38% of malware are being disguised as a Word document as other other files as excel and so on and so forth and you know when you see doc x or xls x you think that as long as it's not an executable exe it should be malware free but the fact is these documents have uh, scripting capabilities uh, embedded and they themselves can propagate malware and uh, ransomware is not going anywhere. It's, it's growing. It's becoming more and more of a trouble. We'll see more issues uh, pertaining to ransomware in the coming years. And malware is, uh, what do you call this, is becoming a major, causing major impact financially, economically, politically, socially, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the damage it's causing is growing over the years. And in 2021, it's expected to cost about $6 trillion in damage. Crypto jacking, as uh, I mentioned, uh, discussed yesterday. Uh, malwares are now are being used as miners, crypto miners, especially Bitcoin, that sits on your computer and uses your computing resource, your electricity, and so on. They are mining and people, uh, this miners make tons of money without doing pretty much anything. Hackers are focusing on new domains uh, like your phone, IoT devices, and so on and so forth. And most emails come from email, so phishing, and so on, right? So, these are some of the uh, reasons for why malware will continue grow other than social engineering and uh, you know the biggest target uh, is Microsoft Windows most malware comes from Microsoft Windows right I think everybody agrees with that but why Windows any reason why Windows is yeah Look at uh, the global OS market. This is, I think, up to last month. You can see that the one in orange is uh, blue is blue. orange is Android. And gray is iOS. This is Mac OS, unknown, uh, Linux, and others. So when it comes to the two target vector or where the majority of the memory comes from are for desktop OS is Microsoft Windows and for mobile OS it's Android. And these two operating system holds the majority of the market share. So, right. and uh, if you look at um, malware by OS segment, so I have three charts over there. M, well, when you see M, it means million, like the one I showed yesterday. Can you guess which one is Windows? First, second, or third? Which OS has the largest malware uh, infestation? So this is, over the years, has been growing into millions, right? So far in 2020, it's 20 million. Right, this is about 851 million. This is about 9,000. Right, 
Which one? First, second, or third? Which one is Windows? Any guess? The second one is Windows. The first one, or the sec third one is Mac OS, and the first one is Android. How come Mac OS has very low malware uh, infestation compared to the other two guys? Any idea? Uh, Mac supporters, come on. You have your reasons. <laughs> yes. What is the reason why Mac OS is? Because it is very secure. Really? <laughs> the reason is not many. You no, know, not many people can afford uh, Apple devices. Uh, if you look at the chart, if you look at the top segment, these are uh, you know people who can't afford to have Apple devices. So we go for Android and Windows, right? People like me. But Abbas is you know, <laughs> fan of Apple, I, I know. <laughs> okay, so I'm actually an open source person and Apple is on the other extreme of openness and innovation and you know when i talk about apple i get you know i'm not very happy with apple because they are very close right two reason why windows is a target of uh, malware because it's popular it makes sense to write malware or something that is widely used right that's also another reason why you don't see much malware uh, on Linux, because Linux is not very popular when it comes to desktop operating system. But what is popular is Windows and Android. So what's the child benefit more if I write malware for both of these platforms? Hence, that's why you see a lot of malware on Windows and in Android. Uh, operating system like iOS and Mac OS, are, number one, it is uh, not very popular, right? Uh, two, it is the, the, what do you call this? The security uh, policy in place is very, very, very tight. Uh, if I were to compare with uh, App Store and Google Play, if I, so I also do app development. So when we develop for both platform, so we use uh, frameworks like React Native and Flutter, and when we publish it on, on Google Play, the process of checking is not stringent. They don't check for uh, so much so for malware, uh, for flaws and all that. They have certain criteria, but uh, most of the time, if it what do you call, complies to these policies, it gets published. Well, it may take two weeks at most to get published. But when you do the same app, when you try to publish the same app on App Store, it may take up to two months. And they may come and say, no, you're not going to publish your app. It looks like a malware. It looks like it's scraping information. So no. So it is very, very difficult to publish on App Store. Uh, so we have questioned Google, why do you guys then don't have such stringent process like uh, Apple do? They say, their justification is very simple. If we are too strict, you cannot get uh, newcomers to be, be able to publish apps, newcomers to be able to innovate, prove to whatever they have and continue building. Yes, it comes with uh, the risk of some of it being malware, but it's a balance between uh, creating uh, innovation and having too much security. So which one do you want? So hence the reason why you see so many malware on Android app compared to uh, iOS apps, right? Because of the stringentness. And you know, I agree with uh, how, why Google does this, right? To spur more uh, app developers, uh, to not to demotivate. You get apps get kicked all the time. I'm not gonna become an app, I'm gonna give up, right? At least they have that platform over there. So these are some of the reasons why 
uh, Windows and Android become uh, has become the major target for malware uh, distribution. Even recently with COVID-19, uh, there has been app that says uh, we provide up-to-date real-time information about COVID-19 and coronavirus. And this is basically a malware. They have in, uh, added, a, a, what do you call this, a Trojan into the uh, app and which basically scrapes information from the mobile device. But, you know, if it gets too stringent, the good guys will suffer more. So, hence the reason for that. Of course, in this uh, workshop, uh, I'm just going to focus on Windows. Android is much bigger, uh, needs much longer talk for that. Even if you go to Windows CE, uh, CVE, CVE is common vulnerability and exposure. Let me, let me try to share that. Share this. Mm, okay. CVE dot meter dot org. You can pretty much go and search for vulnerabilities and exposures within any type of operating system, devices, hardware, switches, and so on. So if you look for a keyword Windows, but right, let's say search, if I click search CVE list. Then I type Windows. You can see the number of vulnerabilities that exist in Windows and Windows related applications and so on and so forth. So many in just two years, in this year, right? CVE 2020 means the year. This is the sequence number over here. So Windows also suffer from uh, a bad security design. And uh, it has been from day one. But the good thing is it is improving. It's getting better. Uh, hope that you know, eventually it'll be on par with Mac OS. Right? Uh, let me stop this, go back to the slide. Right. So I'm going to share some of the prevention or protection that we can do for our Windows operating system. As, far, as, far, as we discussed yesterday, we all do naughty things online, right? When I say don't do it, you're going to do it anyway. So some of the things that we can protect ourselves uh, in, in, if, in the event that we do such things, right? Uh, First thing you should do is to protect your operating system is always do backups, right? How many of us do backups? Offline is basically you can use NAS, Blu-ray, disks, USB sticks, etc., and so on. But my, my, my opinion is the best offline backup will be to uh, use Blu-ray disks because there's no way these disks can be affected or file being erased and so on. Uh, although the fact that uh, optical disk is going out of style, but I, I feel, or in my opinion, Blu-ray disk should be the best way or should be maintained as the only way to back up long-term uh, for your data. And of course, uh, you can use online backup services Google Drive, OneDrive, iCloud, so on and so forth. But what's the disadvantage of using online uh, backup services? I think all of us uh, use Google services. I think some of us use Google Drive, OneDrive, and so on. You upload your content to, let's say, Google Drive. Is there any guarantee that Google is not looking at your data? They are looking at your data. I mean, I'm not saying person is actually going into your drive, checking out what's in your folder, you know, looking at your cat's pictures. Uh, it's not 
uh, people that's looking at, they have AI, machine learning uh, systems that actually analyze the content, uh, look at the images and build a profile of who you are and what you like. And uh, this information could be sold to uh, what do you call this manufacturers, uh, companies that are looking at building future design, future products, so on and so forth. So they are looking at it. But, you know, if you read, you know, whenever there is, uh, when you subscribe to something, there's always terms and condition that you're supposed to read and you're supposed to scroll and read everything. Then if you agree, then okay. We don't do that, right? What we do? I agree. I, 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 I'm not going to read it. I just want to say this. I agree. <laughs> right? We don't care. We want the service. We don't read. But, and also, they purposely make the text very small, make it you know, for us very difficult to read. Right? To actually go through, they actually, you know, we may use your data for a service improvement. Right, anonymous data collection for product improvement. These are clauses which we agree to, which they can pretty much twist and manipulate the TNC and use it for their purpose, which may we may not know. All right. So, whatever that is critical, I will back it up to my Blu-ray disc. Whatever is non-critical goes to Google Drive, in case. Uh, uh, what do you call this? A malware has destroyed my files or my, or my PC. I can always back it up, uh, restore it back from Google Drive and long term data from uh, Blu ray disks and so on. All right? So you can actually uh, stop this. Let me share that again. Share screen. You can try it on your computer. Just go to start and type backup. Uh, this one. Where is that? Here. Okay. So go backup and type F drive. You can use whatever drive you have. It could be your external drive, it could be a C, a backup drive, could be a Blu-ray disc and so on, right? You can even uh, back it up to your network locations, right? And uh, use it to back up and restore. You can even back it up from Windows 7, right? Windows 7 only backs up and restores uh, the operating system, not much the data, but with Windows 10, you can do much more. So set this up. I normally don't set this up on this laptop because I actually borrowed my son's laptop. And uh, uh, so he doesn't need it at the moment, but I do have a backup uh, to my Blu-ray disc. All right. Okay, let me stop. Screen. All right. That's one thing you need to do. Update Windows and software. I think it is very, very annoying. Every hour now and then, I know I, I need to send an urgent email. I switch on my computer. It says, hang on. I got new updates for you. It's going to take one hour. All right? But you have to pull up with it. Uh, so make sure your update is enabled, whether we don't like it or not, make sure that is enabled and allow it to happen when it's required. So the update could be a patch of a day zero vulnerability recently found. If you delay, that vulnerability can be taken advantage by criminals. So my suggestion is do not uh, delay your updates. Right, delaying means you're leaving the window open for 
using criminals to install malware or take advantage of vulnerability of your uh, windows, right? So that's dangerous. Don't do that. I know it's annoying, but you know. Upgrade to Windows 10. I hope there's no one still using Windows 7. Anyone Windows 7? No Windows 7, huh? I hope no Windows XP. I have last workshop as I said, hopefully nobody's using Windows 7. Say yes, nobody's using Windows 7. I said that's good. One guy raised, he said, I'm using Windows XP. He said, okay, you, you need to upgrade. The reason is that Windows 7 has been EOL'd end of life. Early this year on 14th March, 14th January 2020. That means if you continue using Windows 7 and any vulnerability that is discovered beyond this date will not be provided patch or fix or solution because it becomes a playground for uh, hackers and criminals to break in into your system, put malware and uh, steal information and so on. Make sure you turn off, turn your firewall on. I know when we do activities, we like to turn off the firewall because a lot of things will be blocked. After you're done with your illegal activity, do not forget to turn your firewalls back, right? It is important. Uh, where do I face this firewall, right? I mean, let me just look for it. Just go to start, type firewall. You'll, uh, what do you call this? You'll be able to see it in the list. Firewall and network protection. Okay, let me share this. Okay. So this is my son's laptops firewall configuration. What is wrong here? On the public network, the firewall is on, but in the private network, the firewall is off. The reason he has turned off his fire, uh, firewall on his private network because these guys have friends who come home at, uh, or they meet up and they play multiplayer games, local area network. So some of the games uh, are blocked. So they disabled it so that they can play whatever game they want freely. And I actually advised him to turn on the firewall once it's done, which he didn't, right? I need to talk to him later. But you may think that, you know, I only need firewall on the public network. No, you also need firewall on your private network. If one of the machine in your home network is infected, right, it can still carry out attacks on your other computers. So make sure this is always on, on, on. That is very, very important, right? Make sure that it is, you don't see this, uh, make your device unsafe, okay? Turn on, turn on. If it's off, turn on. If you're gonna do anything illegal, turn off, do your illegal stuff, turn it on back. Do not forget. Very, very, very important. Okay, uh, let me go back to the slides. Share screen. Uh, make sure uh, you have an anti malware solution installed. Personally, I don't have anything else more than Windows Defender, make sure your virus and threat protection are switched on, right? Do not, you know, when you uh, do not, you know, when you install illegal software, your antivirus will come in and say, hey, this is a virus, please do not install. What we do, like what I said yesterday, we disable, say, keep quiet, really need this software, I'm going to install it. Fine. Once you're done, please make sure your threat protection is switched on. Nevertheless, many times uh, your Windows Defender will come do a real time scan and still discover that this software is a threat. You install the game. Why is it a threat? Because, like what I mentioned yesterday, the game 
the, the, the game's executable could be embedded with malware. So when you launch the game, the malware launches together. And these anti-malware solutions will basically scan uh, the internals of uh, these EXEs and find signatures of malware. That's the reason why antiviruses still are able to detect malware that is embedded in your, that is why anti-malware still flag your software. Although it's legitimate software, they still flag it as illegal software, right? So disable the antivirus and you know, do use your software. Once you're done with the software, enable it back. It may detect uh, your software to be a threat and remove it. Uh, you either reinstall the software again by disabling the antivirus or you go buy the software if you really need it, all right? Okay, the other thing you should have on your machine is uh, Cyber Reason cyber Ransom Free. You can go Google Cyber Reason Ransom Free. It is a free open source software for Windows, which will protect you from ransomware, right? It's an additional uh, software recommended by Microsoft, right? It's a third party software, I've checked it, it's pretty good. Uh, you should uh, have this on your machine, right? Microsoft Safety Scanner, you may ask this question. I already have been uh, Windows Defender. Why do I need Microsoft Safety Scanner? Well, like what I discussed yesterday, we sometimes disable antivirus, anti-malware, we install stuff. This stuff could have malwares in, in it, gets activated when you launch them. And this antivirus may take over your Windows operating system. Meaning that you cannot do anything. It's locked. You cannot uninstall anything. You cannot remove files. You cannot, uh, what it calls, end process. You cannot do anything. It's locked. Locked, hijacked by your antivirus. You cannot even update. Your antivirus are all disabled. So your malwares are now very smart that they can install themselves. And every time you enable your anti-malware, they will go ahead and disable. So what do you do in this situation? Reformat, right? I can't do anything. What can I do? Reformat. Are my data, if you don't have a backup, gone, right? Or worst case scenario, you can take the drive and, and put it into another computer and try to recover the data. But if you have a uh, hard drive encryption on, gone. So what is my last resort? What else can I do to salvage the situation? What else can I do to remove the malware? Uh, well, you can go ahead and get Microsoft Safety Scanner. Microsoft Safety Scanner is a standalone on-demand scanner. It's offline, does not require to connect to the internet to get a signature and it does not need to be installed. What you need to do is just go to uh, uh, the Microsoft uh, site or you can go just Google Microsoft Safety Scanner, download it, it's about 200 megabytes and just launch. It's, a, it's an executable, it just runs when you, once you have done downloading, it just launch it, it just starts scanning immediately without the need of for installation and so on and so forth. So this uh, scanner has embedded or built-in uh, library, built-in database of all the recent antivirus uh, virus signatures that would be available online. Since your antivirus is disabled, your Windows Defender is disabled. Safety scanner basically takes the whole package, puts in one exe, just download, and, run. and it will start scanning, like you can see over here in the image. Uh, and it will automatically remove uh, the antiviruses that could, not, that could not be removed by Windows Defender. So this is something you would use as a last resort where everything else fails. Even if this fails, next step would be to, uh, I'll talk about it later, there, there are a few other options that you can still recover. But without making any changes to your operating system, you still want to recover access to your computer, get Microsoft Safety Scanner. It's free, open source, uh, designed by Microsoft uh, as a last resort to, to get access to your 
machine. Okay. You know that, you know, I said, I talked about that we all do naughty things. How do we do it correctly? If you're going to do something illegal, something naughty, what is, would be the best way to do this on Windows? The I typically would use uh, something, uh, probably something you know, uh, VMware or uh, VirtualBox, right? Uh, to create a sandbox, meaning that whatever you do, you create a virtual machine, do your naughty stuff, do your illegal stuff, right? And then just destroy the state. So whatever malware that came with it that uh, has infected the virtual machine will be destroyed. But uh, VMware is commercial. You have to pay. Of course, you can also get it from uh, torrent sites. If you're, if you're a person of principle, then you will not use pirated software. So in that case, VirtualBox, it does not run uh, Windows images. Okay. It runs uh, Linux distros and so on. So VMA is out. Which your box is out? What's the next solution? You'll we'll be surprised that Windows 10 has a built-in sandbox, right? Uh, a, a couple of gotchas with the sandbox is that you need to make sure that you have Windows 10 Pro and above. If you have Windows 10 Home, then this feature is not available, right? So enable virtualization, just like you need to do or VMware VirtualBox virtualization needs to be enabled in your BIOS, right? You go open Windows features uh, on and off panel. Uh, let me let me go there. Share this. So you get to this point and you look for Windows Sandbox. And fortunate, unfortunately, I don't have. Why do you think I don't have Windows Sandbox? Because uh, this machine is running on Windows Home. So if you're running on Home, Sorry, this feature is not for you, right? Uh, but if you're using Windows 10 Pro and above, you will see Windows Sandbox. You can launch that, uh, enable that, and uh, uh, let me go back to the slides. Okay. Slide is missing. Let me try again. Okay. So if you look at the image uh, over there, you can launch a VM within Windows 10, right? It is a uh, fresh Windows 10, I mean, it is a bare Windows 10 without any applications, any data uh, that you can access, The you, you can install browsers, you can install applications, you can do whatever not, uh, and carry out experiments, right? So then once you're done, you can save the state just like VMware, and you can destroy it once you're done. So this sandbox environment is very, very important. If you know that you are going to do something that is risky, could be uh, illegal, could cause uh, malware to infect or your computer, this would be one of the best ways to protect yourself from infecting your operating system. So if you are not running Windows 10 Pro, try to upgrade. Uh, and uh, uh, what do you call this, and get this installed.
So I use this also all the time on my own machine uh, for research and experiments. Right. And finally, if everything else fails, a very fantastic feature of Windows 10, it has a reset function, just like you would have on your phone. Factory reset. What does factory reset do? It will just remove everything from your phone and gets it back to the state it was when you first got it. Factory, uh, uh, what do you call the settings? So once it goes into free settings, all the malware and all the, um, what do you call this, malicious content will be gone uh, with it. Uh, you can basically go to start and type reset and you'll come get this uh, dialog box over here, right? You can use this. You have two options. One, you can say, I want to keep my uh, data, right? So for example, first, first option, keep my files. It removes all the software, all the installation, all the settings, but your data in your documents folder, your downloads folder and so on will remain. The second option is complete wipe. So when this happens, all your data, all the apps and everything will be wiped clean. I will always suggest keep my files, try that first. Right? And then if you still, you think that is, the virus is still there, go for the second option. But from my experience, the first option is enough. Keep your files and reset the windows for everything else. That means you need to reinstall the software and everything. And you, if you are using pirated software, when you, you're gonna get infected again. So anyway, you decide, right? So if you're gonna use a pirated software, Try to reset every three to four months. All right. So these are some of the things uh, or, or actions you can take to protect your windows against uh, malware, infection, infestation, and so on. All right. Okay. Beyond this, beyond uh, the point of protection, what, how do I detect the presence of malware? So what we talked about so far is, I don't know if that's malware, I don't know if that's virus, but I'm gonna take these actions to make sure uh, that to the best I can to prevent uh, my operating system from being infected, right? Beyond that, how would I know that there is malware? How would I know that my the <laughs> processes running in my computer that is actually spawned by malware, right? Well, how would I know malware that is not being detected by antivirus or anti-malware? How would I know, right? Well, this is where you need to do some investigation. You need to become an investigator <clears throat> in order to, uh, what do you call this, trace if you have any viruses or malware on your machine. All right. The most obvious place you go to is your apps and features. Install software. Uh, in some cases, malware may also install themselves as software, right? So what you do is you go to app and feature and feature. Share that. One. Okay, here. So if you can see the list over here, it shows all the apps and softwares that you have installed. Right? Install all kinds of stuff. So one thing you should do is first sort by install date. 
okay? And you will see that it will be sorted by the most recent installation that was done. Okay, if you install C++ dis distro, right? And map, right? okay, I know I have installed all this stuff, right? And also look at the publisher, Intel Corporation, Microsoft Corporation. So if you see such things, then you can trust them, right? Opera stable. Did I install this on 6 March? I don't know. I need to ask my son, right? So you have to go through and look at what you have installed and identify anything that looks suspicious. I did not install this. What is this, right? Okay. And what you should do is, uh, like, for example, Web Companion is a malware. All right? Because my son has installed, I can see, Crisis 3. Okay. I'm assuming it came with that or something else that he did. And uh, Crisis 3 is not original. It's, it's got it from Torrent, this one. Right? So, uh, and when he installed, he probably have installed many other stuff, including Web Companion. Web Companion is malware, but it's not a serious threat. What it does, it, it basically pushes ad to your browsers and so on. Not dangerous, but nevertheless, it's a malware, right? So you can basically just uninstall it. It's very easy. This kind of malware can be easily uninstalled, right? It also has Counter-Strike. Yes, what else? CSGO, right? These are the things kids play nowadays, I guess. All right? So scan for your install apps and features. Look for... Uh, suspicious application that you know you did not install and you know you don't install it on on the date that it says yeah this is the date i got myself into your computer you know that no i did not install then uh pretty much uninstall it you know that whether you need it or not just uninstall it okay it's very easy step and uh, many many malwares could be hiding over here as legitimate software Okay, let me stop this, go back to the slide. Mm. Yeah, screen. Okay. That's one. Next place you can check is for check installation folders. Program files, x86, and program files. I have this screenshot from uh, my, my, my other machine. Program files, x86. Do you see anything suspicious over here? Anything that, you know, looks odd? L Y G H O Hi I. What the hell is that? It was installed two days ago, and I checked. It is actually a folder created by malware. There's a malware injected into the folder, right on this date, right? And uh, and I have. You can pretty much just delete it. Okay, shift delete. Okay. Sometimes you could not delete because it, the malware could be running. But list uh, just like with the apps and features, uh, listed or uh, sorted according to the date modified. Look for the dates where it has been installed, right? And this does not exist in the apps and features. It's not there, right? So it is malware disguising because if you put this folder anywhere else, you can uh, pretty much. Uh, be suspicious of it. If it is in program files folder, or oh, program file folder is where I install my program. So whatever is inside is something I can trust, 
Not necessarily. Remember when you, you install pirated software and your anti-malware or your browser says it's a malware, please do not proceed. You say, please proceed. This uh, app would like to make changes to your computer. What do you do? Please go ahead and do whatever, right? You have full freedom. So the moment you do that, you are basically giving administrative access to the malware. And once malware has administrative access, then it can go ahead and create directories, folders, in system uh, folders like program files, even in Windows system folders, and uh, it makes it very, very difficult to trace. But if you spend some time and learn to understand the trait and the behavior and the pattern on how it is done, it, you'll eventually get the hang of uh, looking for malware, right? Like in this case, you know when it's installed, you know it's not there in the app and features, you know you have removed everything that is suspicious over there, and you still see it here, and you click on it, you find executables, right? Delete the folder. This is the next step. Okay. Next is to look for running processes. There's many ways of uh, invoking uh, a task manager. So some of you can go to task manager if you can. Let me try to share. This means we need to Let me share this. All right. So what you're seeing over here are the processes that is running on my computer, right? And this, can everybody see the task manager? No? Yes. Zoomed. Oops. Try that again. Manager, full screen. Okay, so what's happening over here is the list of processor running on my computer, right? Uh, shows status. Uh, CPU used, pretty high. Memory, disk, network. GPU being used, which engine, power usage, and so on, right? So you can right click on the, uh, what do you call this, on the labels. You should also enable publisher, right? Publisher will show to whom this software, uh, which company published this software. So you can scroll through and see that. Microsoft, Dell, Zoom, Realtek, Epic Games, Google, and so on, right? Look for suspicious software. I don't see any suspicious software. Is it start? No. Like for example, you think, I think Opera browser is, looks like a malware. So what you should do is right click on it, open, File location. Can you see the file location? Not sure how to share the whole desktop. Mm. Can you see the whole screen now? Okay, so let me try this again. Let's say I don't trust this software called Opera Browser. So I right click on it, open file locations. It will take me where the executable of the process is. So it is in my directory, user server app data, local programs, Opera Assistant. 
right? So I guess I can trust this. This is not a malware. What else? Mm, so many stuff happening. Mm, I don't see anything suspicious from my from where I see it. You can, if you, for example, Epic Game Launcher, and you go to file location, and you see a path that shows like, C Windows temp, temporary folder, right? The moment see a temp folder where the process is running from, that's a malware. Right? If you see a, uh, the path where the process that we, we check, we check the location, right? It is here, but if the location is temporary, it's temporary folder, it is a malware, right? What you should do is you should first, sort by name, choose the software, right click and test, kill it, kill the process. Once you have killed the process, go to the location where the, the malware is, delete that particular executable. First, look for the location of uh, the process. If it's located at suspicious location like temp or C or uh, in program files where you did not install it, all right? Go back to your task manager, click and task. You kill the process, then go back to the folder where you found the file, delete. I cannot delete this, my son will kill me. So delete, then the malware should be removed because that's how the malware got injected. It copied itself into a temporary folder and got launched. And you remember when you gave permission, hey, I want to make changes to your computer, please go ahead. These are the stuffs happening in the background, all right? Delete the file and then uh, end the process and then delete the file, right? In some cases, in most cases, we are not sure. What is this? Is it a is it legitimate process or is it uh, a malware or suspicious uh, piece of code? How do I check? You can do this. Right click on the process. Let me see, just probably notepad. Right click on the process there's something called search online, right? You want information about this? I'm not sure what it is. Please go ahead and search online, right? So if you click search online, unfortunately it doesn't go to Google, it goes to Bing because it's Microsoft. So when you do search online, it will bring you over here, All right? Notepad. What it is, how to remove notepad exe, oh. Could be a virus, right? <laughs> then they will tell you how to click on the link. They will tell you how to fix if you think it's infected, right? Let me go back to, okay. So these are some of the things that uh, you can do uh, to protect yourself. Uh, detect the malware. This was uh, this was on my experiment machine. One of uh, the infection is called CloudNet. You have things like CloudNet, Cloud Printer, and so on and so forth. They are they are basically malware. So what I did was I just right click search online, and basically it says uh, this is actually a malware. All right, CloudNet or used by some other software and so on. So you need to read and investigate to really make sure that it's a malware and if it is, how to remove, All right? Okay. So this is what I shared just now. If you see in this uh, diagram, wup.exe, it's using about 83% of my CPU. What do you think uh, this is? This is actually a crypto jacker. 
a Bitcoin miner that sits on my computer and mines for a Bitcoin, right? You will see that it shows 82.7, but it's actually will use up 100% of your CPU. If you notice the process is using 100% of your CPU, you should right click on it. So if I right click on it, uh, or like over here, it will take me to the location. So if you see over here, the location of this malware is Soho App Data Local Temp WUP. You can say almost certainly this is a malware, right? It, because it's in temp and it is using 100% of my CPU. I'm sure that it's a malware, right? So I deleted the file and I ended the process and deleted the file, right? That's why one way of detecting and removing malware. And as we discussed uh, yesterday, most malwares are no longer standalone. Uh, they just infect your computer and just sit there and do not and do stuff on the computer. Most malwares now communicate to servers on over the internet, right? How do I, how can I detect what is talking or communicating to servers out there? One basic function uh, tool you can use is Netstat, right? If we go to start, type CMD, right? You can type N-E-T-S-T-A-T dash, put this uh, options, B-A-N. This will show network traffic from active uh, processors and show the name of the processors, right? So. I need to run the command from as administrator, CMD, right click, run as administrator. Yes. You trust that software, uh, then you say yes. CMD is something you trust. Okay. Netstat dash B A N. <laughs> so this is what's happening in terms of communication goes into your on your computer, right? So you need a bit of background and knowledge to understand what is uh, happening. So from here, from your local host to foreign address, so you need to find out what your local host is first. My IP address is 133, right? So you don't have to worry about all those running on other IPs. Just focus on what's going on from your IP to outside, right? I have TCP connection from my IP to our server on the internet on this IP, right? WPN service is something I can trust, okay? This is Teams, I can trust. So with the, the session going on, Zoom is running, I can trust, right? Chrome, yes, Teams, yes. So you need to just start looking at all this PowerPoint, why is PowerPoint talking to a server outside? Okay, never mind. Okay, so you can continue scanning. Uh, Postgres is my database server talking uh, local. So these are local communication, right? Loop back and so on and so forth. So the, all this you don't have to look at, just look at traffic from your IP address to wherever it goes. You can basically find out what this is. What is 52.114.132.20, right? You do a reverse lookup on the internet. IP reverse lookup. Okay. You can go anywhere. There's many tools out there. Type the IP over here. Not this IP. I want this IP. Lookup. DNS lookup. So this IP has no DNS name. It does not say where it goes to and all that. Could be suspicious, but it could be used uh, by WhatsApp, could be used by Zoom, could be used by any other services. But this is how you uh, identify which process is talking to what server on the internet. This is your IP. 
and I'm talking to someone over the internet. 443, and what is 443? <coughs> Anybody can tell me what 443 stand, stands for? HTTPS. 443 means it is accessing a web server uh, using HTTPS. If it is accessing the server using HTTP, what port would we see? Port 80. Right? So you can find out what is my IP talking on what process to what IP on the server internet using what service. In this case, this is uh, uh, what do you call this web? 5228 is, looks like Chrome. I don't know why Chrome is talking to 5228. You can find out what 5228 port is for and so on and so forth. So mostly mine is all web. 443 looks safe, right? <clears throat> right. Let's go back over here. There is a GUI version of Netstat. It's called TCP View. Uh, you can basically go and download it. It's free, open source. You can launch this and uh, it will basically give you more details. What process is running? What is ID? What is the protocol used? What is a local address? This is you, local port. Where is it connecting to remotely? And so on and so forth. So this is easy if you want to do a real-time analysis uh, of what process is connecting to the internet from your uh, operating system. Right? Of course, <clears throat> a better tool to uh, use, monitor the traffic from your network to the outside world is to use uh, monitoring, network monitoring tool, the most famous being Wireshark, right? I, Wireshark is open source. It does passive uh, monitoring. Passive means it does not disturb the network. It does not uh, probe. It does not uh, inject packets into the network to get information. <laughs> your network communication that comes to your computer and goes out from your computer will be able to be captured and visualized here. Uh, I will show you uh, a on my machine. I should run as admin. No, 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 no. Shark and as administrator. Okay, where do you get Wireshark from? Wireshark.org. Okay, you come to this website and scroll down to download. Windows installer 64 bit. I think all of us are 64 bit. Don't have to change anything. Just click next, next, next. Okay, 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 finish. Right? Then it should be available from your start menu. Run as administrator. Right? And you can see these are the list of network interface on my computer. Right? So these are list of interface on my network, uh, my, on, my, on my device. And the current active one is my Wi-Fi, right? If I'm connected to my Ethernet, then you can see uh, Ethernet traffic over here. Since I'm connected through Wi-Fi, I should monitor my Wi-Fi connection. Okay, double click on it. And immediately you will start seeing traffic from my computer to the rest of the world. All right, so a couple of things you should do before you, you uh, proceed is go to where is my preference? Go to edit, go to preferences, go to name resolution, then make sure that uh, 
resolve network IP address over here. All right, this is important. So we can see resolve IPv4, V6, and IPX addresses into host name. That means it will do a DNS lookup. Uh, remember just now I copied an IP address and online pasted it over there and see what it resolved to, what DNS name it provides. You can do that easily over here using this tool. All right, go to name resolution, resolve network IP address enabled. The disadvantage is that it, it creates a bit more overhead because it has to go to the to online, resolve the IP address and get back to you. So I have only already enabled it. And what you see over here, uh, all the communication that's happening real time, source, where is this the uh, traffic is from, we call packet, where's the packet from and where's the packet destination is. So if I'm interested to find out uh, what are the communication that is happening from my IP to the rest of the world. So I should type, this is something you can learn from the website, there are tutorials, very powerful tool when you, when you want to monitor traffic from your computer and also traffic inside your network. Uh, the difference is that the traffic that you see over here are only traffic that comes from my computer and comes to my computer. And in addition to that, broadcast packets. That means packets sent by others uh, to everybody. So I will also receive that. But if they, if another user is communicating with a server outside, I won't be able to do that. To do that using Wireshark, you need to look into something called port mirroring to see for traffic from your network. So port mirroring is another topic you can explore and we can see if there's any malware communication happening within my network. For this uh, workshop, we can look at traffic, uh, look at if there's any malware communication from my computer only, right? Just to look at what's the traffic coming from my PC or my computer, you type, I go to apply display filter up here, type ip.src equals to my IP, right? So this is real time. You can pause to see what's happening, right? So you can see my communication from my IP to outside world is all to Zoom. I don't have, I don't see anything else. All to Zoom. My IP to Zoom, Zoom to my IP. That is all I see, right? Let's see if there's anything else over here. No, 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 no. Okay. So I also talked to my name server. So that means my operating system connected to nf6.us.my. This is a DNS server. And it tried to look up for uh, a query for Google. Right, so uh, what do you look uh, see here? We'll be able to tell you that there is no malicious communication happening on the computer at the moment. So, what you should do is switch off or close all applications on your computer. Close everything, Google. Uh, any network application, your torrent, everything. So you close everything and then run this. And look at if there is any activity that is going out from here to outside world. See if there's any communication. It should be quiet, right? If you don't have any malware, this uh, display over here should be quiet. If you notice that something is happening from your IP. Make sure you have your filter over here, ip.source to this. If it's not quiet, if you notice there is some communication that is happening to and from your IP address, and you notice that the interval is fixed. It looks like it's talking or communicating every five seconds. I notice the communication is happening every five seconds. So that's what most malware do. They have a fixed intervals where they communicate to the outside world. So two things, look for 
any form of communication that is going on between your computer and the rest of the world and look at if there's any fixed pattern, quite robotic, right? It's not organic. If human, we don't have, we don't do anything every five seconds or 10 seconds. It is definitely, or most certainly, I cannot say definitely, most certainly, why malware trying to communicate or another word, it's a bot. A bot that is talking to a server or another bot uh, in a P2P setup, right? So get this installed. It is very powerful. Uh, do this to investigate for malware that could be on the machine. Uh, I will be also use this as part of this project, uh, this ENDS project. We are doing at a bigger scale, as I mentioned yesterday. Uh, we are looking at traffic from all the research and education network in, involving Myron, IDRAN, BDRAN, Pregenet, and looking for pattern of malware communication so that we can trace where the malware comes from, which location has the most malware infection, and so on and so forth. So for that purpose, we have to do port mirroring, and uh, we will employ machine learning to look at trans patterns and so on. So this is what I'm showing over here is the basic uh, the most basic setup that you can do, that you can do to do packet capture, to visualize packets, communication, and figure out if there's any malware communication on your computer. Uh, you can even bring it one level higher to your organization or institution. So your IT guy can set this up, do a port mirroring, and look at the whole network, whose IP is infected, right? Whose IP is spewing out traffic, and narrow down and clean up or remove the machine from the network. So very powerful tool, right? There's a lot of other things you can do over here. Statistics, you can actually look at uh, HTTP traffic. I want to look at HTTP traffic, look at packet counter, right? Then I can show you how much amount of uh, packet traffic, specific application layer packet traffic that has been transmitted uh, and uh, wireless traffic and many, many other tools that you can use, right? A very powerful tool uh, for network monitoring and also malware detection, right? Okay, I will go to the next one. Another powerful tool you can use is called NMAP. NMAP is uh, short for Network Mapper. It leverages on the uh, same uh, technology as Wireshark does, uh, packet capture. Uh, the difference is that it co also combines so if Wireshark is passive, non-intrusive, it doesn't disturb your network. NMAP is non-intrusive and also can be intrusive, meaning that I do probes. To get detail of what's happening in the network, I need to send packets, ping, probe, and to get details of, uh, uh, of what is happening in my network. Once again, this is also a very powerful tool to look for uh, hosts that is running in your network what operating system they are running, what port is open, and uh, the details of uh, the particular machine can be gathered. Uh, so let me try to run the one I have. So if you look at this interface, once again, ZenMap is open source. Let me just go to the website. Uh, nmap.org. Okay, need to scroll all the way down, go to download. Okay. Latest stable, let me zoom this for you. Latest stable version, self rep installer version, nmap 7.8. You don't need this, most uh, uh, OS already has this. I mean, it's already packaged into this. It also comes with ZenMap. So you can use the command line version or you can use the GUI version. If you are a beginner exploring, use the ZenMap. Once you're done, you will see the GUI installed on your desktop. So launch that, right? And these are the basic command that we use to ping. So if I'm going to investigate my net, my machine, so what I do is I type my IP address. What is my IP address? Uh, my IP address is 10.207.16133. Come over here, paste it. Who's the target? I'm the target. Do 
a quick scan. Quick scan will just basically give you basic information. Yes. It will tell you what uh, ports open, right? Uh, so these are standard. Oh, I should close this. Uh, this is uh, can cause. Uh, so this is the fisher viewer, post details, uh, scans, and so on. Or I can go for an intense scan. Scan. It'll take some time because intense scan will now probe my post, my IP. It will probe. Just now, simple scan just showed, oh, these are the pods open. Now what it's doing is I'm going to send packets to the pods and see what's happening. I'm going to try to detect uh, what type of OS that you have on your machine, right? So we have to wait for a while for this to be over. So while meanwhile, I'm doing this, you can also download and install these two tools on your machine and you can explore. This is taking longer. Okay. So these are the details that you get from uh, NMAP, right? Uh, where is the report? Okay. So try to scan. So let me go to the details. These are the pods. This is the topology host details. It says up. We don't see your screen. You, you don't see you don't see this no 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 what, what do you see your face my face why my face not interesting <laughs> you forgot my hands sorry you still don't see the let me share. No, 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 not yet how about now Have you been seeing my face all this while? Or just now? You don't see the screen? Oh, let me try again. Wait, wait. Hmm? Not yet. OK, no. we see the screen right now. How about earlier? Earlier you were able to see the screen? No, only you. Right now, I can see. For how long have you been seeing my face? Uh, maybe two, two, I mean, three to four minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, a reminder, uh, 10 more minutes. Yes, yes, understood. Let me, let me just finish this. Uh, okay. So if yes. you see over here, I've run intense scan, right, on my own machine. And these are the details I can get from my host. What is the operating system I'm running? Most probably Windows. By Windows 10, uh, accuracy is 23%. Ports used are these OS classes, is this TCP sequence, are this, right? Uh, so you can use this information to track and trace if uh, your machine is infected, any port is open, right? And so on and so forth. You can basically specify range. Uh, if I want to scan all the machines in my network, right? I can just now 33 is my IP. You can put an asterisk. It will scan the whole network, right? For this, you don't have to do port mirroring because it will probe your network. That means uh, it will scan everything in your network. So for example, if I say scan, intense scan all TCP ports, there are about 65,000 pods on each host. So what it will do is it will go through every computer in your network. It will scan all the 65,000 pods and go from one machine to another machine until it's done. So you have, if you put asterisk is here, it will scan for about 250 plus machines if you have in your network.
using this tool is fine, but uh, for your network, it is recommended that you should allow your uh, network administrator to do the scanning, right? It's very dangerous to do intense scan in your network because it may overload your network uh, communication. Because remember, this probes, this actually sends packets into your network and uh, see what kind of feedback uh, that you get, right? So, okay, let me stop that. So please explore this further. These are all uh, workshops by themselves. Wireshark and Nmap are two basic tools that we use to teach uh, hacking, right? So if you are also a passionate hacker, these are the two tools you should start with, learn them, very powerful. And if you can get, look at Kali Linux uh, suite of uh, hacking tools, uh, where uh, Nmap, Zenmap, Wireshark is part of the basic tools available on that, right? So you can explore them further. Let me share this. Uh, right, one more slide, we're done. Share screen. Okay. Of course, uh, you can do whatever, whatnot. The source of malware is from using uh, the browser, right? Try, I hope none of you are you still rely on Internet Explorer. Your browser is the best when it comes to privacy, but my experience is the most secure browser is Firefox, right? In terms of privacy and security and prevention, uh, protection against malware, right? But I use Google more, Chrome more, because all our services are tied to Google, your Gmail, your Google Drive, Maps, your Android device, uh, pretty much everything is tied to Google. So Google is second to Firefox, so I'm willing to trade off some security benefits for uh, what do you call this, uh, for other benefits. So either Firefox or Google Chrome, right? There are many other browsers, but uh, in terms, to, in order to balance the, the, the advantage, the benefits it provides and the security level it provides, Firefox and browser uh, uh, Chrome would be the way to go. And also, please make sure you have installed AdBlock Plus uh, on your Google Chrome, right? This prevents a lot of adverse. Uh, as a side effect, also prevents malware from getting into your machine. Uh, so I think I will stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I have a few more minutes for Q and A. Any questions? No questions. We can go for prayers. No questions? All good? Any question for groups? Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor. I'm Faris from Universitas Brawijaya. By using Task Manager, we can see the publisher field of each running process. Um, is it possible for the malware to disguise the publisher field as if it was coming from a trusted company? It is possible, but it, it takes more effort. So uh, publisher gives you an idea that it, uh, you can trust it more, but I'm not saying trust it, right? So mm -hmm. you need to look at the publisher and look at the process. Uh, so uh, there's no guarantee that if it's kind of, it's Microsoft publisher, that it's not a malware, no guarantee. It's just okay. okay, yes. Uh, so how can we determine whether the process is really coming from a trusted publisher? Is, it, uh, is there no way to... Uh, there is a way, there is a way. You know, when you install the, the, the uh, Windows will ask you, this is not from a trusted publisher. Would you like to continue? Okay. What? <laughs> oh, okay. 
Goes back on us. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? We still have like uh, five more minutes before the Friday prayer. Okay. No? Okay. Right on. We can ask online. Yes. Thank you very much. Let's give applause to Professor Salvatore. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye. Baik, sesinya untuk...